Scriptures. Normally I like to hit one quick text and then get into it, but I feel strongly this morning we'll look at two lengthy passages of Scriptures, one in the New Testament and then one in the Old Testament. And it so happens we're going to read the first one out of Luke chapter 1. We're going to read verse 30 down to verse 38. It is coming up on a Christmas season right now, so we'll start with this one. And then after that we're going to jump to the Old Testament and we're going to look at Psalm 79 and we're going to read from verse 9. But let's just do this this morning. Holy Spirit, uh, illuminate our eyes. O open our spirit mind to see uh, what you want to say to us. I in encourage us and increase our faith. Show us the things that we have overlooked and missed. Bring to our attention the things we need to deal with immediately. Uh, deal with us the things that we need to put into our life for our future. But we believe that by the time this message is over, you will have well and truly spoken to us, increased us, and enlarged us in Jesus' name. Now Luke chapter 1 and verse 30 says this, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, that is Mary, the angel of the Lord came to the mother of Jesus. This time he wasn't born, but here's the angel came and said unto her, Fear not. Look at somebody say, Fear not. That's still one of the best messages of the gospel was ever preached. Just simply, fear not. Fear not, Mary, for thou, shall ha thou hast found favor with God. That, that, that one line has been a prayer of mine for the last five years. I, I, I've prayed it consistently. I used to pray, oh God, let me find favor with you. Let me find favor. And a long time back, I stopped saying that. And I said, thank you, Father, that I have found favor. I've got favor in your eyes. Look at somebody say, I've got favor in God's eyes. I started to pray, thank you, my Father, I have found favor. If I've got favor with God, I automatically have favor with men. Doors will open that wouldn't previously been closed. So this angel came and says, Mary, says you have found favor with God. And now you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over all the house of, of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, now, now just a minute, how, how can that be, seeing that I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost. Look at somebody say, the Holy Ghost. Oh, I'd like to go down and preach that message, but I've, I can't. I've got this other stuff running inside me. You know, in the, in the New Testament, he's, the, 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 the Holy Ghost is more times referred to as the Holy Spirit. And maybe it's the old time Pentecostal in me. Maybe it's that old, it's that old one that was brought up into this. I just like calling him the Holy Ghost. You, you like that, don't you? You like to call him the Holy Spirit. He is the same person. But I just think there's something when I call him the Holy Ghost. There's something gets off on the inside of me. Then I know that God's present and his power is there to do it. And here's what she said. She said, how, how can this be? I, I, I don't know any man. And he says, the Holy Ghost. He shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. And therefore that holy thing that will be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And by the way, behold, your cousin Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. Look at somebody say, there's hope for you yet. Say, they're, they're your, cousin, your cousin Elizabeth has also conceived in her old age, and, and she's now six months with her child. And, and this is the one they called her barren. There's another preach in there. They called her barren, but now she's six months pregnant. Listen to this. For with God, absolutely nothing shall be impossible. If you've done nothing else but read verse 37 for the next week, didn't read above, didn't read below, didn't go Old Testament on that scripture. If you read that over and over and over and over again. And when you go to pray, oh God, send us more baked beans. Oh God, let that turkey be a big. When you go to pray, before you ever prayed it, and you just simply made the statement that with God all things are possible, you will immediately eliminate the voice of the enemy that says, you'll never get one. There's no way that's coming to you. You could never, nothing will ever change right here. You can eliminate them words by putting these gospel words in that says, with God all things are possible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, now be it unto me according to thy word. We're going to get into that shortly, but I need to drop back now into the Old Testament in Psalm 78 and verse 9. The children of Ephraim, are you with me? Maybe the guys are putting it up there real quick. Uh, Psalm 78 and verse 9. <coughs> This would be a really good, uh, really I should read the whole psalm, but for times I don't. Listen, it's verse 9. And the children of Ephraim 
being armed and carrying bows, if we were to look into the historical facts about the children of Israel, they were the best warriors there were. These guys could do it. They were well armed. So the Bible says the children of Israel being armed and carrying bows, here's the sad bit, they turned back in the day of battle. You don't know the amount of people that over the years I have sat with that were well able to take the kingdom, that were well able to push through, that were well able to go, but they turned back in the heat of the battle, in the day of the battle, they turned back. The Bible says, and the children of Ephraim, that was the best of the best, the warriors, they turned back in the day of battle. Because they kept not the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. They, they forgot his works and his wonders that he showed them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt and the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. He made the waters to stand in heaps. In the daytime also he led them through with a cloud, and at the nighttime he brought a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink out of the great depth. He brought streams out of the rocks and caused waters to run down like rivers. They sinned yet more and more, provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart, asking meat for their lust. He said, Yea, they speak against God. They speak against God. And they said, and here's how they, here's how they speak against God, saying, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness. That's how they angered, just by making that statement. Can God, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? And behold, he smote the rock. God's answer was not, oh, I'm going to get you. God's answer was this, the goodness of God. Where do you see the goodness of God? He smote the rock that the waters gushed out of it and the streams overflowed it. So they didn't stop there. They went on and said, well, okay, we've got water, but, but can God then bring bread also? Can he provide flesh for the people? And therefore God heard this and God was wrath, wrath. And so the fire was kindled against Jacob and the anger also came up against Israel. And because they believed not and they trusted not in God's deliverance. In verse 40, Verse 40 says this, How often did they provoke him, provoke God in the wilderness, and they grieved him in their desert places. Yet they turned back and they tempted God. Now listen to this. And they limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel. It is one thing for me, Joe Corey, to limit God. People can limit God by not going to church, by going to the wrong church. People can limit God by just living a, a lifestyle that's not fitting for a believer. They can limit God by not reading your word and understanding it. They can limit God by not praying and having communication with them and talking to them. They can limit God. It's one thing for a human being to limit God in themselves. It's another thing when they tie the hands of God and limit him. Because he has proved over and over again that he's not the problem. He's the one that wanted to break in. He did signs, wonders, and miracles. He was not the problem. He wanted in. He wanted to break loose. But every time he wanted to move, they bound his hands. They tied the hands of God. And I read that. And I wasn't thinking about you. And I was thinking about me. And I wondered how many times have I bound the hands of God when God wanted to break loose and do things and, and do extraordinary things and push us to another level, how many times because I've said the wrong thing, I've thought the wrong thing, have I limited God? Limited God doesn't mean that you stopped him dead in the tracks. It means you get a little trickle here. You get a little breakthrough here and a little breakthrough, maybe two breakthroughs in a year. But the word limit means you don't get the whole shimule. It means that you didn't get 100% of all that God had for you. Dear God, forgive us. And we will shake a fist and go, well, where was God and what's God doing? He stands and said, wait a minute, guys. I'm here with a whole bunch. I have it laid up. It's on the, it's on the, the uh, what do you call the escalator elevator? The, it's on the moving staircase coming out of Argus. You know, you go in your parcel and there's a conveyor belt. Conveyor belt, that's the word. It's on the conveyor belt of heaven. It's a sign to you. It's going. But we bind the hands of God and the angel has to hit the stop button and say, well, we have to wait. We just have to wait. We have to wait. I, I've come to this conclusion according to the Old Testament scriptures and the new one that people, good people, are limiting God by what they're saying. They simply, the Old Testament guys, they ask question. Can God really do this? I don't think they were asking the seven, well, do you think God can do it? 
I don't think it was a Bible study in the wilderness and somebody genuinely asked the question, do you think it's possible? Do you think it's possible? I don't think so. I think this come deep from the inside of them. And I don't think it was one time they asked the question, but I believe it was a lifestyle of over again and over again. Ah, oh, goodness sake. Can he really do it? What they're really saying, can God really do what he said he did, will he actually do it? And the more they talked that way, the more it angered God. Can God, can God, you know, they stood on the edge of the wilderness. The wilderness, there's nothing out there but buzzards and lizards and snakes and rocks and God. Nothing out there. And he brought them out of slavery. Man, it was just signs, wonders, and miracles. He brought them out. It was God did it. It wasn't an army went in and invaded. It was God who brought them out. They got out. They're standing now on the wilderness. God says, not far out there. The other side of it. Told Moses, just tell them. It's just a wee bit more. A 10-day journey, actually, what it was. And, 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 uh, uh, but to get to where they needed to go, there was a wilderness. There's this passage. There's this wilderness we're going to have to go through. And then it started. Then it started. The first sign of trouble, then they started. That's when the trouble started. Can God really do this? He's asking us to go in there. Where are we going to get water from? Where are we going to get it from? How's God going? Look, there's no water taps out there. there there's no, there's no uh, fountains out there. There's no water. We can't go out there. We'll die. We'll go out there. This is the way they started to talk amongst each other. Then God said, okay, just watch this. <laughs> Opened a rock and the water came out and said, well, uh, you did a good job, you did a good job. Hallelujah, did a good job. Now, you got the water, but where are we going to get the bread from? There's no spar, there's no central, there's no bread men out there. Uh, well, right, we got water. Well, we haven't got any bread. Can God really put bread out there? So God started when they were there to cause these quails to fly over and, and then just drop. It was like Kentucky Fried Chicken. They, they, on a service, it was like a Chinese takeaway. You just ordered it in and they brought it to your tent door. They're in the tent and the stuff's falling on the roof. And the manna, the Bible says, just outside the tent, the pan loaf arrived outside the door. God set the whole thing up and still the murmured. All right, well, he did the loaf. All right, he did the Kentucky Fried Chicken. All right, he gave us water. But can he provide food? And on and on it went. All right, God provided last Christmas, but can he really do this Christmas? All right, well, I got healed last week, but, but can he really do it now? All right, he got me this job, but can he get me another job? Okay, he got me that house, but can he get me this house? And on and on it went. And God marked it down. And God says, the more you're talking that way, the more angry I am becoming. And I think in the New Testament, there's more grace in operation. And so now I put it a different way. He said, you're limiting me in your life. There's stuff I want to do, but the more you talk like that, the less I can do. You're tying the hands of God. Well, I haven't seen any miracles, because if I listen to the way you talk for 30 minutes, I can tell you exactly why you're not getting any miracles. Well, why is God not doing this? How come it's always happening to me? And I don't think we'll ever get anything, and I don't think it'll ever happen to me. Exactly. You need to read Psalm 78 because you're standing with the same bunch that stood in that desk because they did the same. Can God? Can God do it? Can God do it? And you know what God said about it? It provoked me. It provoked me. God says it provoked him to anger. And they never saw God. They were seriously, seriously limiting. The Bible tells us that in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, it says, Now unto him that is able... Now unto him that, have we forgot this? Now unto him that is able to do exceeding, abundant, above all that we are able to ask or think. Now there's the key. There's the key right there. Whatever you're thinking, God has already set the elevator and the button to come to put away above that. So if you're asking for a hundred, God's thinking of a thousand. If you're asking for a thousand, he's thinking of ten thousand. Whatever you set the bar at, that's where you're going. Now if you're on the wrong side of the fence and you're always talking, well, I'm never going to get anything, then that's what you're putting your faith to and that's what's coming your way. Nothing. Well, I don't think I'm any better this year than I was last year. Well, guess what you're going to get next year? Because you're setting your own course, you're ordering your own menu, you're going down the Chinese list and you're picking one of them, and guess what's coming? One of them. There's no use shaking the fist of God. God's saying, I'm here, I have it all, I'm trying to get it to you, but you're limiting me. This message this morning is called Untie. Untie the hands of God. If you don't know you're tying his hands, you may think you're doing it all right and you're not. You may think you've got it all together and you're not. Because the more you hear, take a tape recorder one day. Get one of the long play ones and listen to what you're saying. 
Listen to what you're saying down the phone. Listen to what, how you describe the problem. Listen to it. But Joe, Joe, you don't understand what I'm going through. Listen, problems are relevant to where you are, but problems have always been. From the day that, that uh, uh, Adam and Eve blew it in the garden, problems arrived. They said there'll always be trouble. To every generation, to every nation, there's always trouble. But a lot of them troubles we bring on ourselves, and a lot of those troubles we limit God in it. We go and have a prayer life, but we're not reaching God. We worship, and we're not reaching God. Because on the other hand, we're saying, can God really do it? We need to, if we want to see God in action, we're going to have to change the way we think, the way we ask, and the way we say. Our dilemma won't change in the first 48 hours, but it will never change until you change. It will never get any better until you make it better, until you begin to talk the way God wants to do it and not in opposition to the way God's thinking. Whenever you take the story of David and Goliath, and David was just a teenager. They say, uh, for those that there's statues of him, there's records of him, there's drawings of him. He was an average guy in his, in, his, in his later years, about five foot seven, five foot eight. He wasn't big, a big, tall guy. But one day, as his early teenage years, he was confronted by this giant on the hillside. He had such a confidence in what God can do that this ten foot, nine foot giant on the hill didn't shake him. It wasn't that the guy was so big. It was whatever the, the war record, the, 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 the warrior, the fighting record he has scared the boots of people. And the Bible says that every one of the fighting elite fighters uh, and champions of Israel, nobody would take him on. When Goliath got up in the morning, yawned, stood on the mountain and defied God and shouted down and abused Israel, all Israel trembled. Till young David, just a teenager, walked in one day when the man was up there shouting and he stopped and looked and he says, Who's your man on the hilltop? Who's that? And they said, That's of the Philistines, that's their champion. And he's out there. He said, Do you hear what he's saying? And they said, We hear him every morning. For the last 40 days he's been out there shouting. He said, He's defying our living God. He's, he's saying that God can't do it. He's accusing God. He said, I'm telling you what, he said, I'll take him down. Because I won't do it on my own strength, but God will get him. And I don't know how it all came about, but somebody believed him. And somebody took him to Saul's tent, to Saul the king. And Saul listened to him. And whatever way he brought it about, he believed. And he said, okay, son, you're just a wee young fella, but all right, you can do it. You seem to me you have such confidence. You can do it. And, they, and Saul said, bring me, bring me his, my armor and put it on the wee lad. You can't understand when you read about Saul. The Bible said when God came to anoint him, when the prophet came to anoint him, they couldn't find him. Saul was hiding in the haystacks. He was hiding amongst the stuff, is what they were saying. And when they brought him out, the Bible said when he stood up, he was head and shoulders above the rest. So he was a big guy. And they put this big guy's armor on little David. And he put it on and he started like this. He said, I can't move, guys. I can't move. Get this junk off me. So they get it off him. And all he had is what he was used till his slingshot. And the Bible said that he went down to the brook and he picked out five smooth stones. And the man of war looked at him and said, Is that it? No headgear, no breastplate, no bow and arrow. Yeah, j just you and us, just you uh, in your shepherd's outfit and a sling. And David said, No. He says, Me and my shepherd's outfit and a sling and five smooth stones and the spirit of the living God. This, look at somebody say, The spirit of the living God. And that guy went out whistling. And the Bible says when he got close enough, he didn't stand any longer. He ran. He ran towards the problem. He ran towards the giant, swinging this as he was going, and whacked in the giant's head. We know, we know the velocity of that wasn't enough to kill the man. But it did when the Holy Ghost got behind it and smacked the man and brought him to the ground. Whenever they turned around and said, listen, is that all? You'll never make it. You'll not last 20 seconds. This cancer will kill you. That disease will never go away. Now that you have sciatica, it will always come back and reoccur. People's trying to scare you. The devil's trying to get fear on you. You have got to rise up and say, well, it might happen to him, him, and him, but it's not coming near unto me, for my God is with me. You have got to understand who you're walking with, who you're talking to. You have got to understand because the Bible says these ones in the, in the, the Israelites, they said they forgot their covenant. You have a covenant with God. There is promises with God. God has promised to do things, but it's two ways. You have got to learn how to claim them, believe them, and stand on them. And not just every three minutes or during a confession session in a church. It's in your life. It has to become a lifestyle. 
It must become a lifestyle. It must become more than just your breakfast and tea. It has to be every living thought within the inside of you that you have a covenant with God sealed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're hearing yourself tell, but can God do it this time? It simply means you've overlooked the covenant. It simply means you've, built, you've forgotten the mighty works that God has shown time and time and time again. He is the mighty one of Israel. He was well able to do it and he proved himself time after time after time. But there's a bunch of them started to limit God because they listened to others and they believed and asked the question, can God do it? I really think they said it in a sarcastic way. Can, can God do that? Well, where was he last week? If he could, and I started to think they started to diminish the works of God. If you're ever going to have signs, wonders, and miracles, you've got to create an atmosphere for signs, wonders, and miracles. You have got to create it in your mind. You have got to create it in your spirit. And you've got to create it with the words of your mouth. You've got to paint the pictures with the words of your mouth. You cannot afford to begin to talk negative and talk down about your house, your family, your children, your finance, or your, or your worship, or your ministry. You can't. You have got to zip it. Look at somebody say, zip it. Say nothing rather than say the foolish things. But I know because people listen to this on YouTube, so I might as well just tell you what's on my heart. But some of you have sat in dead, dried churches too long, and it's seeped into you, and it's got rot on the inside of you. And instead of being in a place where you can hear that God still is God, He never changed, you just sit with the intellect of man coming out with the intellectual knowledge, and it's garbage and it's rubbish. And in your day of trials and tribulations and your hour of want, you don't know how to reach God because you no longer believe God can. You've listened to those that has propagated junk to you and told you that the day of miracles is over. Let me help you. There never was a day of miracles. There is a God of miracles. And he's still alive. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he held one end growing toenail 75,000 years ago, then he can still do it today. And he'll do it tomorrow. You need to get in, into the influence of Holy Ghost teaching. You need to get some revelation on the, on the inside of you so that you'll think the thoughts of God create the atmosphere and take the ties off God's hands. Unlimit God in your life and watch what he can do. You are limiting by your conversation. You are limiting him by your thoughts. And it will not get any better. I'm telling you right now. Oh, Joe, I don't like you talking like that. Well, how would you like it if I come up here every Sunday and say, well, I'm glad you're in church, but you know tomorrow's going to be a rough day for us all. I, 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 and, and really there's no help. But the Bible's good, and, and we'll read a wee story today, and we'll, we'll drink a cup of tea. Well, you might as well have a few beer, because it's, it'll, it'll, it'll serve the heart, the heart and it's going to get really up. Maybe a wee cigarette as we're going along, because really, Jesus loves us all, but this is a nightmare of a road we're going through. And why don't we tell, why don't we ask Eileen to get up here and tell us about your grieving and your trouble? And why don't we get Elsie? Now, Elsie, tell us about that ingrowing toilet. Is it really bad? Oh, it's terrible. Well, there's not much hope for you either. Let's all sing an amen for a Eileen. How many, but David, you, you wouldn't even come back because that's not what you need to hear because you're sp but that's what you listen to come on over come on Eileen come on Angela come on come on Johnny into my kitchen and we come to what about that ingrowing toenail oh your toes amputated last week oh I hope you got a picture of it because my husband's got the same thing maybe you need to tell him he might have to go in the week after and get where did you get your operation and on and on it goes, and you're limiting God. Why aren't we seeing miracles? Because we're limiting God. We have to cut that junk out of our life. I want to tell you right now, if you woke up in the morning with a lump or bump and you were faced with a crisis of cancer in your life and you went down to that uh, city hospital and lined up with everybody else while they put lines inside you and they smile at you and I understand it's so many to deal with and, and it's, it's a nightmare just being in that whole atmosphere and there's no good news at the end of it and if you had to sit there, I want to tell you, you would change your life, you would pre-prioritize your life and you would watch what you say and you'd get every healing tape there ever was and you'd say let's make it work but we got to do it now why wait until you're dying why not get life by the horns right now and ride it like the rodeo and take it out for a walk on Sunday and believe that it's growing and it's getting bigger look at somebody say life's getting good for me Woo, I'm excited now 
I'm excited because Mary, the angel come to Mary. Never in the history of man had this ever happened before. The angel stepped in and said, Mary, Mary, good to see you, girl. Give me a high five. And then as Mary said, who's your man? Who's your man? Who's then the angel turned around and said, Mary, I don't want you to be afraid because I've got some news from heaven itself and I don't want you to be disturbed by what I'm about to tell you. Oh, it's from heaven. Roll it on down, Jimmy. Let me hear. And here it comes, Mary. You're going to have a baby. You're going. And Mary says, hey, Jimmy, just hold her right there. Just, just, just put the brakes on there, boy. Just uh, no, no, you don't understand me. You are going to have a baby, and, and, and the angel's so excited. You're going to have the baby. He is the son of God. You're going to call him Jesus. And Mary's mind now, she didn't hear anything, but you're going to have a baby. Her mind now is in a million different directions, and she said, "Listen, listen, listen, Jimmy, Jimmy, hold on, listen, listen, listen." She said, "She said, but how, how can these things be? I, I don't know a man." I've never been with anybody. I don't know anybody. It has never been in the history of the universe that a woman can conceive without a man being there somewhere. There has to be a man in the wings. There has to be a Devoner chic, handsome individual. There has to be somebody there in order for this to take place. And this angel is coming to tell her there's something that's about to happen to you that no other living soul in the history of mankind has ever had this to happen to them. Can you imagine the shock? Could you imagine it? And it's okay when God says we're going to do that because her next reaction was, was just rough stuff. <laughs> now, can you tell me, how, how is this, how, how can this be? How can this be? But I realized when I read this that she was not in doubt and she wasn't like Psalm 78 where they questioned God and questioned God and angered God. I realized this was a different case because the next words told the difference. She said, how? How can that be? But she said it at the end of her communication. She said this. She said, let it be unto me according to your word. I don't understand this. I don't know where the money will come from. I don't know where the house is. I don't know what their school is. I, I don't know where the job is. But let it be unto me according to your word. Now that's a whole different ball game altogether. That's a whole different speak altogether. And when she began to say, listen, I don't understand the ins and outs of it. God never asked you to understand the ins and outs of it. Do you know the workings of a universe? Do you know how the engine of your car works? Do you know how the petrol gets out of from Saudi Arabia into our time? Do you know it? No, you don't. But you'll still fill up a Tesco's and you'll look for the cheapest price. And when the car cranks over in the morning, you'll still drive it to work. You don't even know how it works. But we want God to give us the details. Stop asking for details. When you're asking for details, you're limiting God. Let me help you this morning. I guarantee you, you're limiting God. I guarantee you, you're limiting God. And you see what I'm preaching? Don't think I'm getting on your case. This morning, I could be sitting on the seat right beside you. And a voice of up here could be echoing and preaching this to me. Because none of us are perfect, but we'll have to work at it. And there's somewhere in our lifetime we're saying, can God? Can God really? Can God? Even though God has proved over and over again, I did it last time, there's always this thing. Well, I know he did it last time, but can he do it this time? Yes, he can. Look at somebody say, yes, he can. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. And we need to get back to say, well, I don't understand it, and I'm not asked to understand, but I trust you. And according to your word, be it unto me. Sarah was 90. Sarah was 90 when the Lord appeared unto her, came to the tent, and said, and said to Abraham, she happened to be listening, and said, your wife's going to have a baby. At 90? At 90? Look at somebody say, don't you pray out over me? <laughs> 90. Some of you would freak out at 50. Some of you would have a freak out at 40. At 90. At 90. Physiological, psychological, and biologically impossible. It's biologically impossible to have a child at 90. And God came just as nice as you like and said, you're going to have one. Got going to be an ordinary one. This one's going to rule the nations. But you're going to have a baby at 90. God's telling you you're going to live through cancer. Nobody else is living. Yeah. Because we're going to have to stop this. If we're going to see breakthroughs, even if you're the first in the universe, still believe God can. God might have come to 10 people already. When, they come, when God came to call Reinhard Bunke, when he came to Reinhard Bunke, he told Reinhard Bunke, and he said, Reinhard, you need to know that you're not the first person that I called to win Africa. I think it was three hours, and God told him the names of the three people that he'd already visited, and the three of them said it's not possible. 
These were big shot preachers and God came to them in the night and said, I want you to win Africa for me. And they said, it's not possible. He came to three others. Eventually, on the fourth try, God came to, to Reinhard Bunke, just a little Dutch preacher. And, and he said, I'll do it. And he says, I'll do it, sir. And God said, you need to know this before you launch out. You're not, the first, you were not my first choice. The other ones wouldn't go. Let me tell you something. God looks first. We need breakthroughs in cancers and disease in this nation. Absolutely. We will never get it by talking negative and down. We have got to create an atmosphere in the Holy Ghost. Even if we don't understand, even if we're not sure, still just, just say, listen, according to your word, be it unto me. We have, as human beings, got a major problem. We'd like to find a pattern for everything that to do. When we find something in God, we want to know, like if you find a prayer that works, could you write that prayer out for me? Because I want to pray. Listen, it worked for them because God showed it to them. It may not work for you. We're individuals and God deals with us as individuals. But we try to find the pattern because as soon as you can re pattern, you can repeat it. It's a natural thing to do. But then we get stuck in a pattern and then God's not in the pattern anymore and we wonder why it's not working for us. Uh, and let me talk about healing for a little while. <coughs> Uh, 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 you say, but Joe, you don't understand, son, that uh, uh, there's no cure. There's no cure for what I got. No, there always is. Jesus said, surely in the Bible, he said, he bore his stripes, and by his stripes we are healed. So when we begin to say things like there is, there's never an answer, there's no, there hasn't been an answer in your life right now. The trouble's still in your answer, the trouble's still there. But, but the more you say, I don't think God can do this, it'll never happen to me, you're tying the hands of God. You have got to get that off and say, well, I haven't got it right now, but there has to be a way. God, I'll find a way. Show me a way. If you read uh, Matthew chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 9, if you just read them two chapters, you will see in the miracles that was performed and in the healings that was performed that Jesus never did the same thing twice. He used different, just through two chapters, he used a variety of methods to get people healed. He never, he never used the same method twice. He just didn't do it. He's trying to show us that God doesn't do the same way over and over and over again. If he does, you become familiar and it becomes boring. God is a God of variety. And, and the minute you learn the pattern, you'd probably not even ask him anymore, will you heal it? You just do the same way, the same way, the same way. And God wants you to keep that fellowship more than your ministry, more than your money. He wants that fellowship with you. So he probably doesn't do it the same way that you've been doing it for the last 40 years. When you read in Matthew chapter 8 and in Matthew chapter 9 in the first miracle, well, wouldn't you think if it worked with the first one, go on ahead and just do the same thing with the second one and do the same thing with it? But he never did. He did something different with the next one. He was communicating with Father. I heard this old guy one time, and, and, and he said that he suffered for many, many years with allergies. Uh, you and I would know that as hay fever. It was at a time when, the, when people were getting filled with the Holy Ghost all over the nation. And, and he was there one night and he came out of just a dead, dry denomination. But nevertheless, he got the revelation of the baptism of the Holy Ghost with power from God on high. And he got filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, and it was enough for his system to get him filled with the Holy Ghost. But the man after filled, filled people the Holy Ghost talked about healings. And he said, we can get, get, God wants to heal you now. Like he wanted to save you. Like he wants to fill you. He wants to, he wants to heal you now. Uh, and so this man thought to himself, well, okay, okay, let's give this thing a go. And he went up with his allergies that he had had from a kid. And he was an older guy. He had had them from a kid. He went up. And his testimony after us, he said he felt the power. The, the guys, the elders of the church, they prayed in tongues. They laid hands on him. And he said he felt the power of God going down in through his ears, going down in through his nose. He said, I know God touched me. And he said after that, he said he never sneezed again. He never, the, the, the allergies, he says, well, well, he assumed then, well, if that's how he got it, that's how everybody should get healed from, from hay fever and asthma. And he told everybody, he said, you don't have to do this, you go over here, you need to get them people, they'll speak in tongues for five minutes, they'll lay hands on you, and you'll get it too. So he had this thing figured out to a pattern. Till one day, it was, it was a long, long time later, but he was out in his tractor, he was out in amongst of all these ragweeds and all was out there, and it was in a high pollen time, and, his kind, and, he, and he said he started to cut through all these, these, these weeds with the pollen was high on it. And as he's starting to cut through, he says, my nose started to run. And he says, my eyes started to water. And he says, my first thought was, oh no. <laughs> oh no, it's back, it's back. 
And he said, I thought to myself, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to wait here to Sunday. Uh, uh, and then I have to go wait till the, the elders get the, the praying tongues for 10 minutes over them and lay hands. And I got healed before, so I got healed again. And he said, he said, Lord, I said, Lord, will you just sustain me to the weekend till I get there? And the Lord, said, Lord brought a scripture that says, resist the devil and he shall flee from you. And he said, I have it, I have it, I have it. Resist the devil. He said, I pulled the brake on the tractor and I switched the tractor off and I set up straight in my seat. And he said, devil! I got healed months ago from this. You will not bring this back on me. How dare you do this to me? How dare you even think you could get away? I rebuke you. I resist you in Jesus' name. Now get off my head. Get off my ears. Get off my nose. Get off my eyes. Get out of this cabin. Go from me in Jesus' name. He said, that fast my nose dried up. That fast my eyes dried up. And I finished the tractor and jump. He said, I've never had hay fever. Never had a touch of it before. But I realized that day, it wasn't. I didn't have to wait to go to the prayer line. And I didn't have to wait till Mr. or Mrs. Such and Such laid hands on me. I realized in the tractor cab that day I could get it right there and then because it was a revelation from God. He said it was many years later. He said I got up one morning he says he said I had awful pain in my leg during the night. He said I got up and my leg, my thigh had swollen. He said I could hardly get my jeans on. My leg was swollen right up. It was bright red. It was burning on fire. Just, his, uh, uh, he didn't even know what, it, what was wrong with him. He just this burning leg. And he said oh God, oh God I, 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 I don't know what's going on here. He said but I'll have to wait till I get to church on Sunday till they have elders speaking tongues for 10 minutes lay hands on me and then I got healed and then he thought wait a minute sure I sat in the tractor one day and God told me I could resist the devil and he said Lord and he had a revelation he said Lord is that what you want me to do this time and the Lord no said no the Lord said no he said I want you to go out for this day on your own take nobody with you and he, they had a house way up in the, in, the, in the hills and he said I want you to go and he said worship me and the man said, he said, listen, the pain was excruciating. My leg was throbbing. And he said it was on fire. It was burning. It was badly, badly swollen. And he said, I, I limped my way up there. And I got up into that house. And I locked the door. Nobody in there. No food in the house. Just, just the house and a new bed. And he said, I got in there. He says, I walked up and down as best I could with my hands. And he says, I worshiped God. I worship God for who he was, the majestic one, the mighty one, my healer, my, my strong tower, my deliverer. She said, I just spent all day worshiping. And then I got tired. He said, the pain was so bad it was draining me. I was sweating. And he said, so I lay down on the bed. And he said, it was starting to get dark. And he said, I can see the, the north star out the window. It's a real bright star. And he said, one more time, I raised my hands up to worship God for who he is and what he was doing. And I raised my hands up and he said, I could see the light. And he said, it was like the light got brighter. And suddenly he said, I says, it was my, fa- my whole body was on fire. And he says, I realized that the power of God was all over me. And he said, I lay on that bed for 15 minutes. And he said, he said, I just felt the presence of heat all over my body. And he said, but at the end of 15 minutes, the swelling had went down. He said, I realized there and then, and I didn't have to wait until the elders broke in tongue for 10 minutes and laid hands on me. I realized I didn't have to resist the devil. He said, I realized there was another way it was called worship. <clears throat> and I, but we got a pattern. And we find if worship works this time, that's what we'll do for the next 40 years. And you're wrong. Because God's got a million ways to do one thing. And we have limited God in our life. If somebody gives you money, we keep going back to that same person thinking they're going to give you again and again. God might have only talked them one time to do something. No, no, God has a million other people elsewhere. Oh, he has people all over the nation. God has a million different ways. Stop limiting God in your thinking. Now, the same man went on to say this. He said uh, in the later stages of his life, he took skin cancer in his ear. And he said, this ear, he said, began to crust. And he said, it was an unsightly looking thing. And he said, the guys that he hung around with, you know what fellas, it's like, they used to mock him. They used to tell him he was growing another ear and maybe it was an alien was coming out. You know the way fellas would do, Jim, you know the way fellas would do. They'd just, just, just mock you. Anyway, and he said, I go to get my head, I go to the barber's. And he said, even the barber would keep me going. The barber used to say to me, no, someone said, that cancer is going to eat into your brain. And you'll have no brain left to see very little to start with. But he said, that cancer's going to eat into your brain, and that cancer's going to kill you. And he said, I, and he said, he said, you know what I do? He said, I just used to sit and smile. Sit and smile. He said, because I had a revelation from the Lord. And he says, this time, he said, I used to rub my good ear. I used to, used to sit and rub my good ear and say, and say, listen, he said, he said, this ear, the one with the cancer, this ear will soon be as smooth as this ear. In Jesus' name. See, that's all I do. Day all the time I can think about. Just rub the smooth ear and say, this ear will soon be as smooth as this ear. In Jesus' name. He says, it took about three months. He said, a scab fell off. And he said, the rest of it overnight disappeared. And it became as smooth as this ear. 
Let me tell you something. We have limited to God waiting on the one guy coming to lay hands on you, speak in tongues for 10 minutes and do it when there's a million other directions to do it. God wants to be intimate. We do need to stop limiting God. If one door closes, God's not using that anymore. There's seasons in life and you go through this season it just plain doesn't work. So why sit at a door that's closed when there's another one opening? God has other people. He has advancements into your life. But if you're stuck at the same stream, stuck with the same thing, you'll hear yourself saying, it's not working. Why is God not talking to me? Why is God not just He is. He is. You have limited God by your talking. You have limited God by your thinking. And you have limited God to think this is the only way that God will get it done. He has a million other ways to do it. Stop using the same pattern with the same prayers like recitals. Pentecostal recitals. That's what we're into. And start and ask God, how do you want me to pray? What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? And it's, a, it's, it's great when you hear God saying, do this, try this, whatever. And you do that, it becomes a real living adventure. I remember you many, many, maybe five years ago, go down in Carlo and there was a, a South African lady, a white South African lady, I think it was just from Zimbabwe. But I remember her coming to the meetings in Carlo several times she came uh, and then on one of the meetings she got born again, gloriously born again. And I remember I came back a month later and when I came back a month later she said something happened to me Joe. I said, did it? She said, well, you know, I got saved. She said, I'm so excited. I'm in love with Jesus. She said, life's never been as good. But she said, my eyesight, my eyesight went in one eye. She said, I just went blind in one eye. I said, well, that's probably nothing to do with your salvation. I said, God loves you. She said, I know, but it's just funny. She says, I give my life to Jesus, and all, in the midst of all this good stuff, this, this thing happened. She's lost the, the eyesight. And, and, and I said, well, we'll pray about it anyway. And, and so we prayed. But uh, uh, she, she had a doctor's appointment. They said they were taking her to see a specialist to get some camera to look into the back of the retina and all the rest of it. And, and she, she, I came back the following month. And, and when I went when we through the door, there was a whole commotion at the door. Uh, and I thought a fight had broke out. And instead it was somebody grabbed hold of me and said, come here to hear this, come here to hear this. And it was this South African lady. She said, God healed her, God healed her, God healed her. She could see perfectly out of two eyes. I said, what are you doing, girl? What are you doing? She said, I was on my way from Carlo to Dublin to get to the hospital to get this test because my eyesight was gone. And she said, I was, sitting, I was driving and I was worshiping God. I said, oh God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you that you'd saved me. She said, I never understand why you could save me. And she was just worshiping God in the midst of it. And then she said, I stopped and I said this. She said, God, I'm, you know I'm going to see the specialist about this. And she said, in the midst of her asking God, she said, I just stopped. And she said, God, you know something? She said, I want you to know. She said, I so love you. I so love you, and I so appreciate what you've done for me in salvation. She said, I need you to know right now that even if I never see out of this eye again, she says, God, I'll worship you for who you are. And she says, her eye popped open. Her eye popped open. There's no rhyme or reason to that. There's no logic. The doctors never got to see it. The medicine never went in. There was no operation. God just did it. God just did it. We have seriously limited God. We have seriously limited God because if we can't figure out how God's going to do it, then how's God going to do it? Because God's brain's a little bit bigger than yours. Because God never asked for my advice. He didn't say, now, Joe, what do you think of this? Uh, Mars is out of line with Venus. What do you think, Joe? Should I move Venus first or should I? He never asked me. He never asked me. He never asked me. He said, doesn't turn around and say, Joe, wake up quick because the lions are on the prairie out there in South Africa. They're in the Gobi Desert now and, and, there's, and there's these little lambs out there have just been born and, and there's this pack of hyenas and there's wolves. Joe, what do you think? What do you think? Will, will, I, kill the, will I kill the hyena? Will I, will I have the elephant walking from? Yeah, Joe, what, wake up, son. Wake up. What do you do? Because I'd probably turn around and say, fix it yourself and go back to sleep. Well, let me see. God has never asked my opinion. So if he's never needed my opinion to heal you or to heal me, then I don't think I need to know his opinion. I just need to know what his word says. And his word says, it's by his stripes I am healed. The Bible said that he sent a man before Israel who went through sufferings and pains so that they could have a deliverance. I don't understand it all, but I believe it all. Has anybody with me this morning? I don't understand it all. I don't understand it all, but I believe it all. I believe it all. I believe we have not seen anything yet. 
I believe our greatest days is still to come. I believe God will keep us alive to see the most fantastic. I believe heaven is way beyond my imagination. I believe there's a place out there waiting in me that one day the gates will open. I'll be sad to leave the, the bunch of people behind. And they'll be, I was going to say they'll be sad to see me go, but we'll just leave that for another day. There, but I believe there's a day I'll stand at the gates of heaven and heaven will open before me. And there's my daddy and there's, and, and there's my grandchild. Listen, there's people there who turn around and hug me there. And I believe when I enter into the gates of heaven, it'll be more be, beyond my wildest expectations. It'll take a million times a million years just to see the glories of it all. I want to believe something that, the, that this life is not all there is. And I believe right now we need to stop limiting God and expect God to move in our houses, expect God to move in our homes. We need to stop saying it'll never happen to us. Will other people get saved? How come ours won't? Let me tell you, they will. Look at somebody say they will. We need to believe for household salvation. We need to believe for the goodness of God in the land of the living. We need to believe that we'll have more money than we've ever had. Not that we can line our walls, but that we can bless the nations and we can go places and see things and do things like we've never done in our expectation in our lifetime before. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen until we raise our level of expectation, until we un untie the hands of God. This morning all over the nation there's churches and they'll preach good messages, but they'll still leave the people binding God, but they'll out through a door. Why does this car never work? How come he's got a jag and I've got a mini? How come this? And we limit God with our conversations. They limited God and the Bible says they provoked God to anger. Isn't that a nightmare? Wouldn't you hate to think that you're provoking God to anger? Wouldn't you hate to think you were doing that by your conversations? I think because we're living in the New Testament, there is a grace that covers us. I really think there's a grace that covers us. If it wasn't for that shield of grace, I think we'd have been dead gone a long time ago. But I think there's a grace that covered us, but we're still limiting God. What have we worked at getting the limits off God? What have we really worked at? You'll have to work now at it. You'll have to work on it. You'll have to start and believe that this is not at all over. That's just the beginning of something good. That God will make a way where there is no way. It's way beyond. Instead of saying, well, it's never going to happen. It can't happen. It can't. You just bind the hands of God. Stop it. Stop it. Another day is another opportunity. Another year is another opportunity. Well, if it doesn't happen last year, let's believe this year. Who knows what's going on? God is sorting stuff out. God is lining stuff out. Just get your expectations high and zip it rather than say anything. Go, hmm. Did you say nothing? Look at somebody say, say nothing. Look at somebody say, I don't want to hear it coming out of your lips. <laughs> oh, yes. Would you kind of, you know how you said, I'm in a house and that's all the talk. Well, you know, if that's all you talk, then you need to go to bed early at night or get yourself to room and put headphones on and listen to worship that you need to get into a church league that's where you can do it. And if you find you're, you're being harassed during the week, you know what you need to do? Take some of them CDs home with you and play them during the week so as the Word of God is going on the inside of you. So that something positive is, o is o overshadowing the negatives in your life. You need the Holy Ghost. You need to understand the Holy Ghost is with you every day, every time. If you could see Him, if you could see Him, if you could physically see Him in your car, physically see Him in a house, you wouldn't talk the way you're talking. You wouldn't talk the way you talk because you can't physically see him. You've got to use faith to believe he's there. But if you really believed he's there, you wouldn't talk the way you're talking. You wouldn't doubt the things you doubt. You'd be saying, am I doing okay? Is it okay if I go this way? What do you think? What do you think? Will I do this? You would have a conversation with the Father. Why don't you learn to have a conversation with him instead of worrying? He came to me and said, fear not. Why don't you stop fearing? Why don't you stop worrying and start trusting? And get over onto that line and say, God, okay, help me. Help me. And when my days is over, hey, you've got something 10,000 times 10,000 better than this. You got it all in the palm of your hand. This morning, my father, I want to believe that people, with the, we, that together we, we, let me include myself there, but we will stop limiting you in our life. Amen. You have so much more for us. You have so much for us to get. You have so much to do. You have so much benefit set up for us. We got, we got all the blessings of heaven come in our direction. But we, are, we repent this morning. We are sorry. We have limited you. We just genuinely didn't know. But we know now. And we refuse to limit you. We refuse to hold back. We refuse to, 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 to put this into a small box when you are unlimited in our life. Holy Spirit of God, I, I thank you this morning that you take time with us. 
that you're watching over us, that you're working with us in our houses and our homes. We go home and prophesy health and strength. We begin to lay hands on ourselves and begin to talk till our prostrate glands and till our kidneys and talk till our bladders and our bowels. And we'll begin to talk and we'll prophesy health and strength and vitality. We'll talk to the legs that's not working too well and we'll command them and believe that they'll run like little children again. We're going to believe right now for the empty wombs that God will fill them. I'm believing for, for, for whatever's going on with you, that if you'll put your hand on it and you begin to speak to it, talk to your kidneys, talk to them. God is giving, don't wait until a disaster hits. Don't wait until you have to go to the over 50 clinic. Don't wait until you have to go to the well man clinic. Have a well, well man inspection yourself and talk to your body. Tell your prostrate to get back to normal size. Talk, look at it and say, no cancer cells will rise in, 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 in my prostrate gland. You need to talk to it. You need to talk to your kidneys and say, kidneys, you'll function properly. You, you, will, you will function properly. You'll break down whatever needs broke down properly. Liver, you will work. You will quiver when you're supposed to. You need to talk to your bloodstream and command your bloodstream. I, I did it just several, several weeks ago. I, I was, I was in the, in the, getting out of the shower and I was just, just getting ready and, and, and I thought, well, I, I, need, I, need, I need to be well. I need to be well. I need to be healthy. And I got nothing wrong, but I just thought I'll start and do that. And so I began to talk to my body. I put my hands where my kidneys was, put my hands where my bladder was, I took my hands where my legs was. I, I just I put my hand on my heart. I, I put my hand where you take your blood pressure. You know all the deals? I just went out. And look, it took about one minute. It took about one minute to mention a bunch of organs in my body and I commanded them to be well and function properly. I commanded well. I thought, fun. that was fun. That was fun. I went back in the next morning and the Spirit of the Lord brought it back to me and said, do it the day again, do it again. And I did it the next, just one less than one minute, I went up and down my body, just talking health to it. And I began to realize that the Spirit of God wanted me to do that on my life. I believe if men will do it, there'll not be as much prostate gland cancer. Blood pressure will start to come down because you'll be ahead of the game. I believe we women can do the same thing. Hands on breasts and believe there's no cancer will come in. You've got to do it. There's nobody's going to do it for you. You've got to do it yourself. Like you take vitamins or you take, so you take certain, when you get a little bit older, you start taking vitamins and stuff to boost you. But you, instead of taking alongside of them supplements, why don't you take a Holy Ghost supplement and talk to your body and talk to your limb and talk to the wrinkles and command them to disappear. Daniel Bird talked to his hair one time. He was losing his hair. He got into the shower and he says when he got out, he says it was like a carpet down there. His hair was falling out. But he started, started to lay his hands on his head every day. Every day, get in the shower and every day he lays his hands on his head and commanded the hair on his head to grow again. And you saw him last day. He got a thick head of hair. Now he's going the other way. Now he's believing for it to turn black without dying it. And so now you can see this blackness come. Blackness is actually coming. The darkness has started to come now. Because he believed. He prayed for his eyes that he could see again. But you have to do it. It's, you just got to press. You got to do it. It's your life. It's your health. Do you want to live to 50? Do you want to live to 80? Do you want to live to 90? Do you want to go on for a while? Well, then you're going to have to start and talk to your life. Talk to your body. Talk to your wallet. Get your wallet out and set it out and say, you will be filled in Jesus' name. Call that money in. Call that romance back into your life. Call love it. Love's going to live here again. <laughs> Yeah, you got to do it. Take the photographs of your children and say, you will be healthy and strong and you will be wise and you will run your race in your lifetime. We'll have a legacy. To you you got to talk it. You got to talk it. God talked and spoke a whole world into existence. He said, do the same, do the same, do the same. No more negative talk. No more dying putting. Start to lift yourself up and watch God in action. Now, Father, I just thank you for this morning. Thank you for the teaching. Thank you for what you're doing. We believe in liberty in the Holy Ghost. We believe the Lord will sweep through our lives in a genuine new way. We will see signs, wonders, and miracles. We will be into that place where, God, you will turn up and you will prove yourself strong on behalf of people. You don't have to prove anything to us. We already believe your word. But help us to untie you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at somebody say you're looking better already. All right, back at 6.30 tonight. God bless you.